Bishop Cavallis. MP James Patterson. James Patterson, welcome and uh, happy Easter Sunday. Great to be with you. Happy Easter to you too and your viewers, Patricia. Let's start with this big issue of the week, which was superannuation for housing. The Prime Minister has been reported to have killed off the idea by saying, you know, he hadn't changed his view from his previous comments. He had said, of course, that it was a thoroughly bad idea. Do you agree with him that it's a thoroughly bad idea? Well, Patricia, I'm going to disappoint you a little bit, I fear, um, in that I'm not going to try to get into the weeds of this issue here, um, and that's for an important reason. Um, generally, I'm someone who thinks that uh, in public policy debates, the best thing is to let a thousand flowers bloom, and um, a healthy public debate, even within a political party, um, is no bad thing. But I think there is a little bit of a difference uh, in when it comes to a budget. I think that the best process for a budget is not to have uh, members of the government engaging in uh, for and against campaigns on an issue. So um, I'm going to keep my, my comments on the, on the substantive issue at a bare minimum. OK, so many of your colleagues didn't follow what you just described. In fact, I could list them, lots of ministers, I could go on, but I, I know you know that list. Did they make the wrong decision? Well, I'm only um, explaining why, why I won't be talking about it in detail. It's um, obviously up to every member of the government to make that decision for themselves. And as you know, the Liberal Party famously tolerates a, a very high degree of public um, debate and um, individual conscience. And I think that's uh, been generally served us very well. But um, on this instance, I'm, I'm not going to um, row the boat out any further on that. OK, but has it been an unhelpful contribution given there has been so much reporting about effectively a split on policy and, and not one that sort of anyone's fabricating, something that we can see through people's comments, tangible comments on the record. Well, look, I think it's been overhyped a little bit and I think there's been a bit of breathless reporting on this. Um, it's I don't not think a revelation. So. We're talking that, well, on the record disagreement. I mean, Matt Canavan saying it's a, it's a good idea while uh, others, uh, including Christopher Pine, who I spoke to on a radio show last week, saying it's a bad idea and would push house prices up. These are people openly disagreeing with each other. How is that hyping anything up? Well, I don't think we should pretend that it's anything particularly revelatory or controversial that people within a political party have different views on some issues. Um, we, we are uh, individuals and we all represent different constituencies and we bring different perspectives. And I think it's a perfectly normal thing that there are members of a government who have a different view and have a debate about that. I mean, on every issue, that's, that's how these things are resolved, some more publicly and some less so, clearly. Um, but uh, I don't think that's a, that's a shocking revelation myself. Darren Hinch said young people had unrealistic expectations about housing. What do you think of that comment? Should we accept that young people perhaps should be renters, that, that the culture's changed, the economy's changed, that we have an idealised concept based on the way things were, you know, some time ago, things have shifted. What do you think? I mean, you are a young person as well. Should we shift our, our thinking on this issue? Yeah, this is an issue which absolutely affects my generation uh, and my peers who are all struggling with how they're going to get into the housing market. Uh, I think we don't need to rely on what Darren Hinch's personal opinion is or what my personal opinion is. We've got data which um, backs up uh, the claim that this is a very serious issue um, because the multiples of an average income to buy an average house are higher now than they ever have been in Australian history. Uh, it, it costs you more years of your working lifetime to buy and pay off a house now than it ever has before. And, and it's not even close to, to what it was um, 20 or 30 years ago. So I think it is a genuine issue and I think the, the statistics bear that out. What I'm not, I didn't ask you about whether it was a genuine issue. It's about whether, yeah, the facts are right. We both agree on the facts because they're facts. I'm talking about the way we view it. Is it something we mm. should accept rather than something we're desperately trying to turn around? Well, I don't think there's any reason we should accept it as just the status quo and just the way that things are now and that young people should just suck it up and deal with it. I don't, I don't accept that for a moment um, because there are policy levers that we have um, collectively between the state and federal governments at our hands that can solve this issue. Um, it does not need to be a problem. It can be resolved. Um, and the evidence overwhelmingly shows that the primary cause of the escalation of prices is the failure of supply to keep up with demand. And we know why supply fails to keep up to, with demand, because there are artificial constraints on the supply, um, particularly of land and what you can do on that land. And that um, inevitably drives prices up as it would in any other market. Senator David Lionhelm was on Sky and he says that, and I'm, this is a direct quote, the levers that the federal government has at its disposal really aren't all that useful in terms of housing. 
affordability. Is that how you see it? Because you just described it in a different way. Do you think the federal government has a, a really crucial role here? Well, they're somewhat limited, and we certainly cannot fix housing affordability in one federal budget. And anyone who uh, thinks that we can, I think, is not being realistic. Um, this is a problem which has built up over many decades of policy at the local, state and federal level. Uh, and the idea that it can be overturned and in, in one federal budget is, is not realistic. Um, primarily, though, as, as David was clearly indicating and, and as you've um, alluded to, that the major levers are in the hands of the state governments because they control the supply of land and, and the rate at which that's released and how much of it's released, and they're primarily responsible for the regulation of uh, how you build a house on, on a land and what that process is like and how quick or slow it is and how expensive uh, or cheap that is. Um, so that, they are primarily responsible for it, but there are some things which the federal government can do to help, and you'll see uh, some of that in the upcoming budget. Short, sure. has the federal government raised expectations on this issue too high? Are you concerned that now there is enormous expectation from the public and you know there's no reason to doubt why they feel this way everyone knows why people are feeling this way but that they expect that they, that this budget really has to deal with it in a way that perhaps you're unable to or unprepared to well, they're absolutely right to expect that we do deal with it, and they should be right to expect that this is the start of the process of dealing with it. Um, but if anyone out there thinks that there is a silver bullet or that the federal government can overnight fix this, then that's not realistic, and they should reassess their expectations. Um, I, I think this will be an important first step uh, in the process, but by no means will it be solved overnight. Um, it's something that will take, I, I believe, a number of years to successfully um, be implemented and it will require not just the federal government doing the heavy lifting but state governments as well doing their part. But you genuinely believe that you have enough policy levers to turn around this trend to see young people particularly where a lot of the discussion has been but of course there are others also in this boat re-enter the housing market not as renters but as owners. You think that you can change the trajectory? Well, if the federal government does its part and if the state governments also do their part, then yes, absolutely, we can start to turn it around. Even with all of us pushing in the same direction, it will take some time, but uh, we can start that process. So, one of the things the Reserve Bank Governor was speaking about last week in his um, speech, on the, which, which touched on this issue, um, is that supply is quite slow to respond. Houses are not built overnight. So even if we had a policy change uh, tomorrow which allowed supply to be expanded, it would take a few years for that to work through. Um, we just don't have the labour force, for example, to build all the new homes that we'd need to have a substantial impact overnight. So it will take time, but if, if we're all rowing in the same direction, then absolutely we can do it. Just a final question on this, before, because I do want to talk about a few other issues beyond housing. But a lot of people raise with me, and I know you've heard it too, the issue of immigration. You know, every time house prices come up, people say, well, how about the issue of immigration? And, and I know Tony Abbott has raised this too. Do you think that's something that needs to be considered, that, that immigration should be slowed down to deal with this? Well, in my view, immigration is a complex issue and there are a lot of factors in deciding at what rate our immigration should be set at. Um, there are arguments for increasing it or decreasing it. Um, but I'm, I'm not persuaded that uh, fixing housing affordability is a very, um, a very significant factor in deciding it. Um, the reality is if we stopped immigration tomorrow, we would still have a housing affordability problem because we don't have enough homes, we haven't built enough homes and we're not about to build enough homes without policy change. Um, so. On its own, it wouldn't fix the problem. Um, and anyway, it's quite possible to have a high immigration rate and also have affordable housing. Um, no one has suggested that the United States, for example, um, has a dire housing affordability problem that could be solved by stopping immigration um, because it's a country which um, must, much more lightly regulates the lease of land and what you can do on land, so its supply is able to expand to meet demand. So demand in and of itself is not a problem unless there's an artificial constraint preventing the market from uh, delivering that supply, which is what we have here in Australia and what we have to address if we want to fix the problem. Just two other issues. White House military advisers are, brief, are briefing London that the US is considering a preemptive strike on North Korea's nuclear facilities. Is that something Australia should support? Because it's, it would dramatically escalate uh, the, the issue on the Korean Peninsula. 
for very obvious reasons, I'm not going to get into um, endorsements of hypothetical military actions uh, by the United States. Um, but what I would say is that it is an incredibly disturbing situation uh, and that Australia absolutely stands and must stand with our friends and allies in the region, like South Korea and Japan and the United States. And that, as the Prime Minister said, we expect the Chinese government to do more to rein in the North Korean regime and to prevent them from conducting further missile tests. Just one final issue uh, as we jump around the big issues of kind of the last week as we have a pretty, I think a lot of politicians are hoping Easter gives them a bit of a reprieve. But really interesting announcement today. The New South Wales government announcing a new anti-bullying strategy will replace the safe school strategy after Malcolm Turnbull's government said it would not fund the program beyond the mid-year. Now, Tony Abbott has tweeted about it. No doubt you're across this. But I know some, and I've spoken to some of them on your side, say, actually, he let this go through when it was raised with him as Prime Minister. He didn't do anything about it then, and yet now, you know, he's being very active about it. Do you share that perspective? Well, I don't know, Patricia, because I wasn't there at the time. I came into the Senate in March last year, which was um, after Tony Abbott um, ceased being Prime Minister, so I wasn't there and I can't say with confidence um, one way or the other what his policy on it was. Um, all we can see from the public record is that um, this government has announced it won't fund the program any further, um, and now the New South Wales government has announced that they're going to change the program. And I, I welcome that because I think um, bullying is a really serious issue in our schools, and young people are experiencing, you know, really horrific bullying. Um, but it's not limited to any one characteristic of young people. It's not just their sexuality or their gender. It can be their race or their weight or their height or any other. Um, characteristic and it, what we need is a holistic anti-bullying strategy which teaches young people about respect and, and manners and treating each other um, fairly and decently whether or not we approve of um, people's uh, lives the way they live them uh, or not every every child it deserves that, that dignity and respect. You say you want a broader anti-bullying um, uh, project but if you look at the statistics themselves Gay and lesbian young Sorry, people. Sorry, I just lost you there for a second. I um, said, you yeah. say you want to have a broader anti-bullying project or, or anti-bullying you know, scheme in, in schools. But if you look at the statistics, young, gay and lesbian, transgendered people, people in this category, broad category, mm -hmm. are subjected to, to harassment at a very high level. You don't think that, that that is a particular issue that needs to be dealt with? No, I don't doubt that for a second. I think it is a particular issue, but I think the best way to address that is about teaching young people that they need to respect um, all of their peers, regardless of um, whatever their criteria is that's causing them to be bullied. Um, th that's a much better way of doing it. I mean, the, the founder of the Safe Schools movement, um, Ros Ward, has admitted herself that this is not really about bullying. Um, it's about fundamentally changing uh, society through the education system and what young people are taught. Um, that is not something that taxpayers should be financing in our schools. What they should be supporting um, is a proper, you know, directed uh, anti-bullying program. James, thanks for coming in and I hope the rest of your Easter is excellent. Thank you, you too.